Holland and in Denmark. And something that the, uh, the people who write about Voltaire never mention, which is a great, very puzzling and great mystery, because any objective person who looks at the Voltaire's writings from the end of the 1760s down to the end of his life, say the last 10 years of his life, I think it's impossible to come to any other conclusion that Spinoza is by far the main philosophical preoccupation of Voltaire in his last years. The only, the only explanation I can come up with as a historian is that the people who write about Voltaire are so puzzled by this, what on earth is he talking about Spinoza for, that they just ignore it as some kind of uh, symptom of senility or something. But you, they, they can, they, no, even his... The, uh, de la métaphysique, even Locke, is nothing compared to Spinoza in the last 10 years of Voltaire's writing. No other philosopher even begins to compare in terms of the emphasis and centrality that it has in Voltaire's worries, in Voltaire's writing, in Voltaire's letters, in Voltaire's thinking from the end of the 1760s onwards. Spinoza is the central issue, and the rest is all very marginal by comparison. And this is, uh, I think, a most extraordinary uh, Phenomenon. So, um, in, as the Spinoza's challenge escalates in this way in the late 18th century, uh, writers had to um, look for new ways to, to stem this challenge. Uh, Jacobi's uh, reaction, of course, is very well known. But lots of other writers were, uh, during the period of the Pantheismus strike, suggesting other strategies. Karl Heinrich Heidenreich, for instance, 1764-1801, uh, offers a, a, a detailed critique of um, Mendelssohn's concept of a purified Spinozism linked to Leibnizianism, and he connects this in a very interesting way to the Kantian controversy. In his uh, Über Mendelssohn's uh, Darstellung des Spinozismus of 1787, written after a, a, a very close rereading of Spinoza's uh, ethics. And a, again, in his next book, in uh, Heidenreich's next book, Natur und Gott, he argues that Mendelssohn was fundamentally mistaken in identifying an underlying convergence between uh, Spinoza and, the, uh, and, and Leibniz's pre-established harmony, that this is, this is a, a red herring. And... Uh, of course, he, he, he's unable to accept Spinoza's denial of creation from nothing and providence and insists that these are unprovable and perhaps Spinoza's greatest error. But Spinoza's denial of the possibility of miracles, um, uh, which on Kantian grounds he holds no, Spino uh, no uh, philosopher could possibly prove, he still thinks is the, is the great challenge of the day. And the strategy he offers or suggests as a way of uh, blocking Spinoza is to accept the, um, a bit like Jacobi and uh, or Rayburg and other commentators in the late 18th century, to accept the formidable, in fact, incomparable coherence, insuperable coherence and cogency of Spinoza's system within its own terms, as something you can't negate with Jacobi's leap of faith, but uh, qualify it and, uh, uh, and neutralize it by combining uh, Spinozism with Kantianism, which is what, which is what he recommends um, uh, the philosophy professors of Germany to do, to, 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 to uh, couple uh, Spinozism with uh, Kantianism. Uh, he, he thought without Kantianism, he insisted, uh, there is no defense against unmodified Spinozism. So the way to, uh, to neutralize Spinoza is to, is to place it in uh, a Kantian framework. Maybe uh, Solomon Maimon, the Jewish philosopher, uh, who uh, turned to reading Kant after be, uh, studying Spinoza and being, becoming very enthusiastic about Spinoza, is trying to do something of the same sort himself. The great drawback of the solutions uh, offered by, philosophical solutions offered by Hume and Kant from uh, a reformist perspective in the 18th century, and remember how much was wrong with 18th century society. We're talking about uh, the, these philosophical debates, of course, are not going on in a, in a vacuum. In the years before the French Revolution, it was obvious to any 
fair-minded, aware person, uh, that uh, there, there, there was a, a very serious problem of archaism of the laws, of inequality before the law, of a social hierarchy with uh, most wealth concentrated in the hands of aristocracy and uh, a degree of wretchedness and uh, poverty amongst most of the population. Serfdom, of course, still uh, prevalent in very large parts of Europe and slavery in the New World, etc., etc., etc. The marriage laws were... There's many, many controversies and problems to do with marriage laws and uh, illegitimacy and the impossibility of getting divorce and all the problems relating to a set of marriage laws based on the theological principles which were causing very severe social difficulties and problems. And a great deal of awareness of all this and uh, it's not surprising that it's not only enlightened despots but everybody uh, throughout Europe, Britain included, where there's a very powerful reform movement of course in the late, in, late 18th century that, uh, you, you, that, that, that the, the legal frameworks and institutions of the past are highly unsatisfactory. Con e even the most moderate parts of the Enlightenment, Voltaire, Turgot and so on, fully accept that you, you have to change many things. Uh, I would even say that the moderate enlightenment talks about revolution. It's not only the radical enlightenment who are talking all the time about revolution in the 18th century and, of course, lie behind the, the, uh, the revolution of reason of 1789. But Voltaire or Frederick the Great also talk about revolution a, a great deal because they thought that the the toleration that they wanted, the weakening of ecclesiastical authority, the, um, uh, the strengthening of uh, individual liberty, at least amongst the elite, that were so such far-reaching changes that this was a revolution too. Uh, so there's a very real problem which philosophers perhaps would tend to, uh, because of the way they approach these issues, I, I, I think are... Um, um, conditioned to seriously underestimate, and I, I mean this as a serious point, that there's a very major drawback with the solu philosophical solutions offered by human cat, which is the reliance on, uh, on tradition and on religious authority to, uh, as to underpin their moral philosophy and therefore their, uh, their positions on uh, law and uh, uh, political reform. Of course, Kant was able to, uh, to, to work his way to much more liberal positions at a later stage than Hume never was. Hume is used uh, continually even by the most reactionary people in the late 18th century. And uh, Hume's position on reform is, of course, so conservative. He, he even was willing to defend the press gang in England that you, uh, because the only basis, really, for the moral order in Hume is tradition and indirectly religious tradition, uh, that uh, from a reformist standpoint, Hume is, is practically useless, and there are very real problems with Kant as well. So uh, they are offering uh, a moral philosophy which, uh, in which the, uh, the true source of moral truth and values on which legislation and social theories need to be based uh, are still vested in uh, either the reality or, as some would say, as the radical enlightenment would say, the pretense that, that uh, morality is divinely delivered and that divine providence governs the world. So th this means that Leibniz's um, theodicy retained an extraordinary relevance to uh, controversies throughout the, the, the 18th century. Either Leibniz's Theodicy is through and through justified and the world is providentially ordered by his pre-established harmony or at least some kind of Newtonian, uh, providential Newtonian physico-theology. Uh, either that uh, or uh, Spinoza and Bale, irrespective of whether the uh, latter's pretended fideism is taken seriously or not, uh, or not are the sole guides and good and perfection, as Leibniz puts it, relate to us only, that, 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 uh, that goodness and perfection are social constructs which men have to uh, devise themselves in order to create a moral order useful and proper to society, so relate to us only and not to him, meaning uh, God. Not only are 
Spinoza and Bale, always the main opponents with whom Leibniz is constantly wrestling in the theodicy, but this exactly reflects the realities of the entire Enlightenment uh, dispute over theodicy, down to and including the Kantian controversies. On a moral level, then, uh, human can do not, in the end, remove the choice that ultimately everyone must make as regards good and evil between Leibniz and Spinoza. Either the world was created by a benevolent god or the world created itself. And we continue to be faced with this choice uh, in a way today. Leibniz recognizes as an equally uh, unavoidable concomitant of this that our souls are necessarily either intentionally created or else pre-existed. At one point where he says of Spinoza explaining that uh, he uh, acknowledges no goodness in God, properly speaking, and teaches that uh, all things exist through the necessity of the divine nature without any act of choice by God, that we will, uh, Leibniz says at one point, well, let's not waste time here in refuting an opinion so bad in, in, and indeed so inexplicable. But while on one level he rejects Spinoza peremptorily without discussion and, ex uh, as I say, uh, uh, ex um, explicitly, at least, on one level, accepts Bale's claim to be a fideist. Um, Leibniz is also acutely conscious of the implications of Bale's breaking down the ancient distinction uh, between substances and accidents and his embracing and frequent use of the Cartesian conception of substance in relation to volitions as well as physical events. It is well to beware, he warns, lest in confusing substances with accidents, in depriving created substances of action, one falls into um, Spinozism, into a Spinozism which is an exaggerated uh, Spinozism, which is an exaggerated Cartesianism. If accidents are not distinct from substances, and substances are in constant motion and sub subject to constant change, why shall one not say with Spinoza that God is the only substance and that creatures are only accidents or modifications? So um, Leibniz was very well aware that the problem and the challenge that Bale posed for him was inherently linked to and coupled with the challenge of Spinoza. In any case, despite the seemingly peremptory dismissal of Spinoza's denial of God's freedom and denial of freedom of the will in men and denial of immortal souls, um, the, his presence unmistakably permeates many passages of the theodicy, including much of the discussion of Bail. In one place, for example, Leibniz consciously touches on exactly that point of near convergence, namely that after the pre-established harmony is established, an unalterable order of relations between things and ideas follows. Uh, that very point that was to be the basis of the charge of hidden Spinozism that um, especially German pietists like uh, Joachim Langer and others leveled against the Leibnizio Wolfians in the 1720s and 30s, um, that uh, a convergence that um, was also perhaps to be the basis for the claim advanced by Mendelssohn and Lessing later in the 1750s that it was from Spinoza that Leibniz borrowed his most important idea, as they call it, the pre-established harmony. Um, when touching on this point that after it's chosen the order the idea that the order of things and ideas is one and the same and follows inexorably, uh, I, I, Leibniz shows an awareness of his uh, proximity to Spinoza. Of course, there's a fundamental difference between the two conceptions, as both Leibniz and, um, and lots of commentators later, Lessing and Heidenreich, stress. That's to say that the divine nature is determined toward that which it produces by its choice and through the motive of the best produces a different kind of immutable, inevitable, irrevocable 
necessity, one that is only moral and that is a happy necessity instead of uh, 